Okay, well, good afternoon from Singapore and to, good morning to everyone uh, in the UK. And thanks very much for, for joining us uh, today um, for this session where we will talk about IP uh, and Singapore um, with a particular focus on uh, the maritime uh, sector. So my name is Justinian Habner and I'm the Deputy Director for the Department for International Trade uh, here in Singapore. Um, and I'm really pleased to have you all join us. And, um, you know, what we want to talk about today and hear a little bit about is sort of Singapore's innovative maritime scene, uh, and then to consider what you need to do to protect your IP. Um, it's a really important topic. Uh, out here in Singapore, there are many funds, there are many accelerators to support the sort of maritime uh, tech startup scene. Um, but you need to think about how you want to manage your IP um, if you're going to engage with that out here. So to do that, we're going to hear from three speakers um, and I'll introduce them um, in, in turn uh, as we come to hear from them. Um, they will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes each and then we'll have a session towards the end where if there are any questions that you may have, um, you, can, you can put to them and, and I'll sort of conduct a online panel session. So throughout the, out the session, as you're hearing people speak, type in the chat box, uh, in the Q&A box, sorry, um, any questions that you have, um, and we'll pick them up at the very end of the session. Um, so today, it's uh, the session is being hosted by the DIT, as I said, but uh, a particular thanks to our friends at Maritime UK for their support uh, as well. Um, so if we go to the next slide, thanks. So for those who don't know, I think probably most people do know, but for those who don't know a little bit about uh, DIT, um, we've got these sort of four main objectives. Um, and I suppose this is really about um, uh, the trade side today. So sort of looking at objective number one. So we're really wanting to encourage UK maritime companies um, to, as it were, trade and export out here into, into Singapore. Uh, if we go to our next slide. Uh, so that's a little bit about DIT, uh, just so you're aware, you know, uh, we've got uh, people based in uh, 111 countries um, um, and uh, we've got over 1,400 staff um, based in, in, in across those countries. Um, so, so we are here to help you um, to export. Um, so my focus today is on, on Singapore. Um, I think the, the reality is though, if you're looking to come to Singapore, you're also thinking about the wider ASEAN and APAC region. And if we go to the next slide, just to give you a bit of an example of the types of areas that we particularly focus on in Singapore, financial services, infrastructure, tech, and at the very top there is, is maritime. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge um, that we work very closely with the British Chamber of Commerce um, out here as well. Uh, so we've got to sort of uh, say there is that, I mean, it's a very different year, obviously. Um, we can't do our usual um, uh, trade missions and, and those sorts of events, but uh, the DIT team in London will be uh, working um, to host as many things online and to sort of connect you virtually out into the markets such as here in Singapore. So let's move to our first speaker uh, and we want to set the scene really to hear a bit about what the sort of maritime outlook and opportunities in a broad sense are out, out here in Singapore. Uh, and for that we've invited Toby Stevens uh, to join us um, and Toby is uh, head of HFW's shipping offshore and logistics team in Singapore and he also heads the, uh, the firm's world leading global crisis management team in APAC. Uh, so he joined uh, HFW as a solicitor in 2001 and has been a partner with the Admiralty and Crisis team since 2007. Uh, I think, you know, he's recommended in Chambers and Partners and Legal 500 as, and, as well as Who's Who uh, Legal in other directories uh, as someone to listen to. So let's listen to him today. Um, over to you, Toby. Uh, thank you, Justin Yin, uh, for that uh, intro, and also to uh, DIT and Maritime UK for the, uh, the opportunity to uh, speak to everyone uh, today. Uh, for those that don't know HFW, we are a, uh, a global uh, sector fo focused uh, law firm. Um, maritime is the key and historically the biggest um, sector within the firm. It accounts for about 45% uh, of our, uh, our revenue. Um, and uh, we've been in uh, Singapore for a, a, a long time. We recently celebrated our 30th anniversary here. So uh, uh, we like to think we know uh, the market uh, reasonably well. Um, my remit uh, is to give you a brief overview of the maritime sector here um, with an eye for future developments and, of course, opportunities. Um, and it's, 
it's been suggested to me uh, that now that we've weathered the uh, the COVID storm, we really should be calling this back to the future, if that isn't too cheesy. Um, and certainly we want to be looking at uh, more prosperous times now that we've entered the year of the ox, uh, very auspicious here. Um, but Singapore's uh, maritime and offshore sector is um, truly comprehensive. Um, it, it includes everything from shipbuilding, ship repair, offshore engineering, ship owning and management, chartering, trading, insurance, banking and finance, and right the way through to uh, professional services that support the, uh, the industry. Um, and the, the economy here uh, supports uh, companies from multinationals uh, right the way through to a network of um, small and medium uh, sized companies, SMEs, operating to, uh, to support the, uh, the sector. Um, and Singapore is very good uh, at that and, and uh, nurturing uh, small startups and bringing them on. And we are, we are an example of that, um, having started with uh, one of our partners in a pot plant uh, 30 years ago, we're now a, an office of around 80 people uh, with a significant turnover and contributing to the, uh, uh, the global network. Um, but there's no escaping uh, the fact that uh, uh, there's been an impact with COVID, uh, but uh, I have to say, even in the midst of the, uh, the pandemic, uh, Singapore's uh, maritime performance has remained uh, remarkably resilient throughout 2020. And just to give you a couple of examples of that, uh, container throughput remained uh, roughly stable at 36.9 million TEUs. The port remained open. Uh, they've done an excellent job of uh, overcoming the, uh, the problems of crew changes. They were still they're refining that uh, um, uh, throughout, uh, continue to do so. Uh, Singapore remains the world's top bunkering port. Uh, sales reporting an increase of 5% uh, year on year last year. Um, and the, the total tonnage of Singapore flag vessels remain broadly stable at about 95 million gross tons at the end of last year. So uh, the, the, the economy, the maritime economy here is, has uh, remained uh, remarkably uh, stable. Um, I, I saw something recently that was posted by the Prime Minister here uh, saying that the uh, FU, uh, financial year 2020 uh, budget deficit was 13.9% of GDP. Um, but in uh, FY 2021, that will reduce already to 2.2% deficit, which is just a, an astonishing recovery in, in such a short space of time, given the, uh, the effects on, on a, uh, a smaller country. Um, if we can move to the, um, uh, the next slide. Uh, so the session today is very apt because uh, Singapore has aligned itself to the ambition of being a uh, what they call a smart city, to stay ahead of the competition um, with a focus on innovation and technology. Uh, and this focus on digital technologies today is a key driver for the maritime industry, but for Singapore in particular. Um, and, that, and that focus on smart and technological transformation is uh, comprehensive. Uh, so the, uh, it started back in 2016 when the, uh, the budget then uh, in, in Singapore launched uh, what they call the Industry Transformation Program, which developed uh, roadmaps, if you like, for 23 industries, uh, which were to build partnerships between government and industry. Uh, and maritime was one of those key industries, of course. Um, and then move forward to uh, 2018, they, uh, they set out uh, the Sea Transport Industry Transformation Map um, which builds out the Maritime and, and Port Authority of Singapore's strategic long-term plans to develop uh, Singapore's next generation port and strengthen Singapore as an international <clears throat> excuse me, maritime center. So breaking that down, um, the key strategies here are to strengthen connectivity and interlinkages um, domestically and internationally, um, growth through increased productivity and innovation and to support investment in order to develop a maritime workforce uh, of the future. 
Next slide, please. <clears throat> So if we look at those three aspirations and, and give uh, some tangible examples, um, in innovation, for example, uh, for maritime technology enterprises and startups, which should be of particular interest, there's potential to receive uh, support from the industry-wide acceleration uh, program. Uh, they've established three main maritime centers of excellence to uh, support research and development. Uh, the MPA awarded uh, a total of uh, 1.625 million Sing dollars to uh, joint industry projects uh, in an effort to drive that maritime innovation. And they continue to advance R&D activities. They're working together with a number of industry partners. Uh, American Bureau of Shipping is a, is a key one amongst others. Uh, and Singapore is also part of the Mass Ports Next Network, MAWS. Maritime uh, autonomous surface ships, of course. Uh, autonomous navigation is an important part of uh, their plans for Singapore to be a, a, a port ready for the future. And in terms of productivity, um, the NPA initiatives uh, are there to support companies uh, to improve business processes uh, by adopting and developing uh, technological solutions. So they're supporting those that can provide those solutions and also the technology for the companies that need it. Um, and mar maritime companies can make use of the, uh, the Maritime Cluster Fund Productivity Grant. Um, and plus there's the uh, Industry Digital Plan to boost uh, small and medium-sized enterprises uh, in adopting digital technology. All of this designed to try and uh, make sure that the um, uh, the, the, the businesses here in Singapore are ready for the future. Um, and, and in relation to that, the workforce as well, the Maritime Cluster Fund that I mentioned provides funds to support the reskilling um, so that they can gear up um, for a smoother transition of the workforce from historical industries to their um, target industries like, uh, like the maritime sector. And then in relation to uh, the connectivity, um, uh, the MPA uh, is working with uh, Singapore government agencies such as Enterprise Singapore uh, in order to grow Singapore maritime companies into uh, global leaders. And this is, this is something that they're very keen on. Uh, they're encouraging access to expertise and talent. They want to draw it in from uh, around the globe and um, basically to, uh, to draw that expertise, train the, um, the companies here and, and, and make them uh, fit for the future. Um, <clears throat> and there are more than, excuse me, uh, more than 50 uh, Singapore-based uh, startups have received uh, a liquidity boost from the uh, Seeds Capital Fund, which is in the investment arm of Enterprise Singapore. And there's another 50 million Sing dollars made available um, in co-investments uh, and to industry partners with the MPA. So that there are those funds uh, available. I'm sure others will talk about those. Uh, but the MPA is uh, expressly supporting the, the diverse needs of, uh, of maritime enterprises to develop that range and scope of maritime services uh, in order to, uh, to make uh, this the maritime hub of the future. Um, and then if we go on to my uh, final slide, um, <clears throat> We can, I just want to say a few words um, about uh, the, uh, the, the green uh, enterprises. And uh, for those of you that know Singapore, it's a, a green oasis in an otherwise industrial part of the world. Um, and its future uh, strategy, business strategy embraces that. Uh, and looking at maritime in particular, we know that IMO 2030 and 2050 with the emission targets are going to require advances in sustainable technology. And of course, there are already industry pressures to improve fuel efficiency, cost savings. And Singapore is investing to promote greener and more um, digitalized sector. So by way of an example, uh, this includes the Maritime Green Future Fund, which has got a very healthy uh, Singapore dollars, 40 million, uh, about 30 million US to focus on developing technologies and trial the use of alternative maritime fuels, methanol, biofuels, electric vessels, et cetera, et cetera. And they're um, 
including heavy investments in LNG bunkering capabilities here, as you probably read. But even today, there was an announcement in Lloyd's List about Singapore backing a, a project to use ammonia as a, a maritime fuel. So um, Singapore has said that uh, ships meeting the enhanced green initiative will benefit from a, a concession in port dues, um, which, of course, is, uh, is going to encourage um, that uh, that drive for, for greener fuels. Um, <clears throat> they've also got the what they're calling the uh, the next gen G E N network initiative that stands for uh, green and efficient navigation. Um, they are the cutting edge of international decarbonisation uh, initiatives, and the new comp, uh, concept for that um, was introduced by the IMO in Singapore during a, a recent global webinar on decarbonisation. So they're very keen on on uh, pushing that, pushing themselves to the forefront. Uh, re really, in, in summary, in, in short, uh, Singapore uh, has a stated ambition to be the number one maritime hub in the world. Um, and at, at the very heart of that plan is innovation and technology, but particularly green technology. Um, so with with that sort of um, background, if you like, um, I'll hand back to Justinian. Great. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Toby, for that. Um, I mean, I think some of the key messages we've just heard there is you know, it's a stable uh, sector out here. There's a lot of investment um, taking place. Um, we've heard about the funds that are available. We've heard about green maritime. Uh, and I think the importance of MPA ESG and some of these are potentially topics that we might want to come back to in the Q&A. So just a reminder to do put your questions in, in the question box. So. Um, with that as, as, as a sort of a, as a scene setter, let's go to our next speaker. Um, so the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is uh, my colleague, Christopher Koh, um, who's the regional IP and business and trade advisor for Southeast Asia. Um, so she is based here in the High Commission in Singapore. And so she represents the UK intellectual property, intellectual property office. Um, and her key role is to focus on providing IP support to British businesses. Um, importantly, uh, before joining us in 2013, uh, Christabel worked um, at, spent six years at the IP office here in Singapore. So she knows this sector um, very well uh, here in Singapore. So Christabel, over to you. Thank you, Justinian. Hello, and thank you for taking time to join us today for the session. Um, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm hoping that Besides learning more about what IPOs does, our support and resources available to you, we could cover the essentials of intellectual property and how it ties in with maritime where it's the core of your business. And hopefully we'll be in touch beyond um, this session. Next slide, please. Yes, so over here, I would like to ask everyone a really quick question. Um, what happens when your IP is stolen? Um, grateful if you could do one click and it should tell us the reason, uh, the answer to what happens when IP is stolen. Well, it's gone. If safeguards are not put in place to protect your IP, it is stolen. There is very little a business or corporation can do to get it back. So that's why I think this session emphasizes on how you can manage what's proprietary to your company, even if it's as simple as an accidental leak by an employee within your company, there is very little corporate can do. Next slide, please. So very quickly, what does IPO do? Some of you may be aware of our presence in the UK. It is an executive agency within the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. It is both rights granting and policy making agency. We also proactively focus on IP ed education and outreach, uh, such as sessions like this, as well as supporting IP enforcement in the UK. We have over 1,400 staff in Newport and a smaller office in London, including seven IP attaches like myself who are located outside the UK, covering various markets um, and regions who are based in Beijing, New Delhi, Geneva, Sao Paulo, Washington, and Singapore. And like what Justinian mentioned, our key role is to support UK businesses looking to internationalize. Next. So I would like to quickly cover these agenda and uh, these are the three areas. First, I will cover what is IP in brief. 
What are the main types and the importance of intellectual property for your business and the maritime industry? Next. There are many, many forms of IP around us. Uh, today, where you are, you'll be able to identify it in the products we use, in the business you own, and that includes your trading logo, your trademark. Uh, almost most com all the companies would have a form of brand identity, and that's your logo, your trading logo. You would have a company website, a business know-how, and many more, and these are proprietary to you and your company. Trademarks for brand identity and logos that are on your business card, for example, uh, patents for invention, designs for the way objects look, domain names for website, copyright for your manuals, your instructions, written and artistic works, and others including confidential information, trade secrets, technical expertise, sector know-how, and others. One of the key takeaways I hope everyone can go away with today is to really understand what are the different forms of IP and the intangible assets that you have so that that helps you in your journey to identify what are your intellectual property. To give a very quick example, your UK or home trademark pattern and design registration will not protect you in any overseas market. So it only protects you in the UK if you register in the UK. There is no such thing as international copyright, international trademark, international pattern, or international design that will automatically protect your rights throughout the entire world. However, protection against unauthorized use in a particular country depends on the national laws of that country. And most countries do offer copyright protection for foreign works under international agreements. Now, this is subject to whether that particular country is signatory to that particular agreement. So pattern and designs generally granted on first to file. So if you file it first, you have the right to use it in that country. Similarly for trademarks, they are generally granted on first to file or first to use depending on the country. So you should consider how to obtain respective protection for before introducing your products or services to overseas market. Next. You would have um, heard before in live imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. However, in business, imitation of a product is a threat to one's livelihood, to the business owner. IP protection can be an invaluable tool for preventing competitors from wrongfully benefiting from a product success. Uh, conventional wisdom might suggest that one form of intellectual property protection is best, and that is dictated by the nature of the product. For example, the instinctive choice of protecting a functional product such as a lawn mower may be a pattern, while a new line of clothing may be thought best protected by trademarks. Now in reality, if we look behind these lawn mower uh, owners uh, as well as brand owners for clothing, a product may contain various forms of IP and by seeking the different forms of IP protection for various aspects of a product, it may be possible to create layers of IP protection around the product, which makes it much more effective in hindering competitors copying than a single form of IP. So imagine the different layers of IP as a bundled snake stick um, together. It's a lot easier um, to deter others from copying because it takes a lot more effort to bring you down. Now, the link on this slide brings you to a collection of case studies on how IP has benefited companies. I'm not going to go into it because I would like to spend the two, two slides to talk about maritime in particular. Uh, next, please. Right. So you may already know this, that the maritime industry is one of the oldest and most important industries of our society. The maritime industry is the backbone of global trade especially in the last 12 months. Everything can stop, but logistic moves. And it's responsible for transporting large volumes of cargo around the world. You would have observed over the years, um, new inventions and softwares have helped the maritime industry work more efficiently and eff effectively. Use of softwares features extensively in the uh, maritime industry, such as navigation, container management, carriage of goods and supply chain management. At present, if we look at the pattern database in terms of invention in this area, the United States followed by South Korea have the maximum patterns in this particular field. 
for expansion of the maritime industry, we can see different governments across the world, they are having different kinds of incentives, grants and developments to push the frontier of this um, oldest, one of the oldest industry. And the need of the hour is for faster environmental friendly ships. And in view of the same, there is also a substantial increase in pattern fouling, providing solutions for the same. Pattern applications ranges from environment focused innovation to AI-based patents for autonomous ship that was mentioned by um, Toby earlier. And we know that Rolls-Royce is in this space. And other examples are technology inventions for shipbuilding, where Lloyd's Register is in a space of 3D printing ship, shipping parts. So these are just a few examples of where the bigger boys are, but there's definitely room for meat and as well as the uh, entrance, new entrance into the maritime industry looking for sort of the future solution. Now, the last paragraph here, which I found it interesting when I was doing a bit of research is one of the agreements that we have on Paris Convention um, is a pattern in a, a, a member country cannot be enforced against a visiting ship belonging to another member country when a ship is in uh, international transport. So what this means is the intention of lawmakers behind the said exception is to avoid territorial pattern rights from hindering international commerce. That said, exception takes away the possibility of a private citizen interfering foreign trade by enforcing their national pattern right against a patented technology on board a foreign ship. Can you imagine in the case of absence of such an exception, a ship owner would risk facing different claims of pattern infringement in the different ports of call they visit. It will potentially subject itself to search and seizure of the ship when a patent owner decides to challenge and enforce his or her patent right. So in a gist, the technologies in a ship is protected in a way when they go around the world um, at the different ports of call if they are part of the international transport um, ecosystem. Next. On uh, maritime R&D, I think this is a sort of a macro view of where Toby came uh, and talk about green shipping. Um, I'll start off very quickly on smart shipping just to bring you through the different focus that Singapore has. The Singapore port and maritime industries are gear gearing to, to deal with dig digitalization and disruption of global trade, uh, global transport supply chains. As a mega port operator, Singapore aspires to embrace adoption of the latest digital technologies to operate in its um, next generation port for ships coming in full operation by year 2030. Various initiatives in this particular focus uh, that Singapore has collaborate with industry partners across maritime value chain for maritime technology innovation, like the establishment of the Maritime Port Authority Living Lab, a test environment um, on emerging technology and innovation. The second vertical here is the green shipping mentioned earlier by Toby. It's about reducing emission from the shipping harbor and port activities in Singapore. The Maritime Singapore Green Initiative has funding scheme uh, in, in this space for free technology development and deployment. Third, we have port technologies. Again, we also heard earlier about port of the future. This will feature new digital solutions to become uh, among the most environmentally sustainable ports in the world. The port operator, PSA Corporation, has launched an incubator and technology promotion concept called PSA Unboxed. Uh, it has a very interesting and comprehensive list of technology needs related to the current and future port development. So if you're in this space, take a look at the technology needs that the government has put out from Singapore and see whether you're, you could flex your solution to sort of customize and um, be an answer to some of the issues or needs that is on the list. Um, moving down quickly, ocean technologies, the government and industry is working hard to evolve its manufacturing industry, including yacht and offshore engineering. Technology Center for Offshore and, Mar and Marine Singapore is located at the National University of Singapore. It is intended to be a national uh, integrator for research and development between institutions like the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, uh, the university and industry, and that's where you come in. 
a core facility is the um, the hundred million Singapore dollars ocean basin with its fifty meter peat for deep ocean technology modeling and studies. So it's a space if you are looking into collaborative R and D, and you have a solution for ocean technologies, that might be a space you consider. Uh, finally, we have got the aqua aquaculture technology. Singapore is currently looking substantially to increase its domestic seafood production through land-based and oceanic aqu aquaculture. So this, I thought is one of the uh, uh, niche area, but in all of this, um, we will see challenge funds, grants and incentives that's embedded uh, across each of the focus area. An example is the Maritime Green Future Fund at US 30 million that Toby mentioned. Uh, from our past interaction, organizers of challenge funds may include lines on intellectual property and other terms and conditions in the registration, in the application, in the grant agreements. And this is where we need to read the fine prints. What are you giving away? What is given to you? In Singapore and elsewhere, there are many models and they are there. And if, if they are asking for a transfer or assignment of IP ownership, then there is a long list of implications in our perspective for the funder or organizer, um, because they will have to co-share or fund uh, maintaining the cost of the life cycle of IP, such as renewal fees, if there is a pattern, design, etc. For example, in the case of UKRI and welcome funding position, they do not seek um, directly uh, to own or co-own IP arising for their fund. That is IP created at the back of the funding belongs to the inventors belongs to the inventor as well as, you know, in, in short, when you put it into the patent document, it is owned by the employers, the companies benefiting from the funding. So organizers are not in the picture in terms of IP ownership. Now in other situations, uh, funding organization look to have allocation of ownership um, of the IP code develop, that is IP joint ownership. Uh, we have included on this slide a link to our guidance on model agreements for collaborative research. Next. Now, the second area I'd like to cover is Southeast Asia in brief. I'm moving away slightly to uh, from maritime and spend a bit of time on Southeast Asia, what it means to you, what are support we can provide to you, uh, specifically to UK companies. Next. Now, Southeast Asia, if you do not already know, is an interestingly diverse and high potential business opportunity, but it's legally fragmented. They are very different. These numbers made sense during the pre-pandemic days, but it's illustrated here to allow you to appreciate the potential of the region when ASEAN as a regional trading bloc makes a comeback. We support British companies to resolve IP issues worth 100 million pounds annually. Since inception in 2012, uh, through one-to-one -one support and business outreach, the network has reached more than 30,000 businesses wanting to operate overseas. Now in Southeast Asia, we support at an average about 1,000 companies from micro SMEs, startup to MNCs on matters related to IP every year. And we offer UK businesses free and impartial IP advice. Now we fall short of something uh, as part of the advice service is we are not lawyers and However, we have member law firms from across British Chamber in the region, so we are unable to provide you uh, advice on legal matters, but we will be able to link you up to valuable contacts. Uh, likewise, Toby, feel free to reach out to him. Um, and, and all of this resource will be here to help you navigate some of the IP related risks in the region. Um, take us as a sounding board to partner with you in your journey, in your ambition, what you hope to do in the region, what are different modes you would like to operate, this is a practical aspect of the support we are offering. So take advantage of the few resources in the following slides to point you to both materials and access to expertise in the local markets. Next. Now in the next four slides, you will see a lot of links that are available for you to take away and sort of look it through, reach out to us thereafter. You'll find the resources available for you to help you understand what to look out for so that you can navigate the risk of expansion that can cause millions of pounds of loss when trading in the region. There are success cases and many uh, in, in business venture in the region because they make an effort 
a conscious effort to, to manage what's proprietary to their company. So here we have um, a list of briefs, guides, uh, guidance as well in terms of how you pro can protect your UK intellectual property that you register overseas, as well as some country fact sheet if you would like to deep dive into a particular country. Next. And sessions like this, IP awareness uh, events and workshops across UK and overseas, um, a lot is happening virtually as we can, and we are already familiar. So you can gain a lot uh, of information you need in the comfort of home. IPO do have a, a list of group shows, webinars that you can find out from the calendar. Talk to other businesses, uh, reach out to Maritime UK, British Chambers um, that Justina mentioned, his team in Singapore, if you're interested to, to find out more, uh, the Department for International Trade, as well as UK ASEAN Business Council in London. Um, and then you move on to the next step. Once you have no sort of the broader scene, what are the specifics, then you go into the profession because now you are ready with information that you can ask specifically the professionist, the specialist. And this would be your agents, your distributors, your suppliers. Um, you have to work with them together if you're not in the country and how best to safeguard your rights because they may be helping you to push out your brand, your solutions across the region. So the, protecting your IP should be part of your business plan, business strategy. Uh, finally, on uh, point five is carry out your own due diligence of your, uh, of your intellectual property. There are free tools under the regional in initiatives, such as the ASEAN trademark, design view and pattern scope that allows you to search trademark design pattern on a common online database covering participating Southeast Asia member states. Uh, speak to us and your IP lawyer when you're ready to see whether there are previous registration of your IP in the region. Uh, otherwise, do consider and register your slides, uh, your, your rights early. Next. So these are the regional IP initiatives I've mentioned. They are free, a click. It acts a bit like a Google uh, search database. Key in your brand name, for example. Uh, it could be HFW and see whether it pops up, uh, whether it has been registered by anyone, whether it's still um, maintained or has it been dormant. If it is dormant, there is a chance you could register. register. So take time to explore uh, these platforms as mentioned. Uh, the links are here and I understand if you need the slide decks, we can share it after the webinar. Try running a trademark test and then um, if you have any doubts or question, reach out to us. Next. Now, IPO has a suite of online training tools designed to help businesses and your team. Um, education doesn't stop at one person. You need the entire team in your company to be aware of what's proprietary and what the team needs to protect, which is the core of the business. Um, they are free for use. Once registered, you have access to the business focus resources. So do share these. Next. Finally, um, in, the last in the last section, I would like to cover, if we can have the next slide. Yeah, I would like to cover some takeaways for you while you manage your IP. You also need to know what not to infringe on others. Next, please. After all is said, said and done, there is a need for a multifaceted approach. You will need a sound IP management and filing strategy in Southeast Asia, as well as understanding the rules of engagement and sector compliance regulations that may affect how you operate, such as data localization and data protection rules. You may also need a proper licensing contract to define who owns it, what is the business model, what data are you sharing, um, what rights are you giving away, which fields of use, which territory, is it Singapore only, or it spreads across the whole of Southeast Asia? Is it exclusive, non-exclusive deal? Is there a right to sub-license, whoever you're licensed to? Um, how long is the contract? A year, three year, five year, room for review? Um, it is advisable to conduct a freedom to operate search before a project commences if you are looking into collaborative R&D in order to check if there are already existing technology uh, in the country. So freedom to operate is the ability to proceed with uh, r and I mentioned and commercialization of a product without infringing uh, valid IP rights of others. So there, there will be many others who are also in similar space. So it's good to make sure you check rather than facing it as a roadblock further down 
the root. On technical publications, uh, this is where preclude, precluding others from patenting the same technology by publishing and able uh, data management techniques. This is one of the ways that we observe how some industry players do. They do not file a patent, but in technical publications, they disclose. Um, a little bit like open innovation, so they disclose how they go about getting reaching the end result. So pick up these defensive strategies from emerging leaders and big boys on how to protect their unique selling point and their core technology. On managing um, trade secrets and, copy, uh, and confidential information, if it cannot be reverse engineered, the tactic will require implementation of very strict company policy and employee agreement language. Limit the number of people um, who needs to know because once secrets and confidential information is out, there is very little you, you can do because it's already in public domain. You can sue, but it's a expensive approach to go down that route. Next on algorithm, do consider how you can protect your algorithms, your source code, uh, register your trademarks early, and you must continue to monitor the market if anyone uses your mark. IP is a private right, and the UK government is unable to enforce your rights on behalf. We are only able to, to, to sort of guide you and signpost you what are your next steps, but we, un, we are unable to act on your, on your behalf. A common concern for us when seeing UK companies at trade shows that Alex mentioned, there are a lot lined up for this year um, that is happening virtually is the trade-off of wanting to make sales and showing customers advanced technology versus the risk of exposing key aspects of your technology to competitors who may also be visiting your display or your e-booth. If you have these issues, then the need to train the sales force or the team manning your display or participating at e-booth um, in a way to remind them not to over-disclose into the area of trade secrets. Now know your competitors, know who are the players in the market, in your space. Finally, we have included a link to your to, to uh, NDA, non-disclosure agreement, which you should keep a good record of who you sign it with. Final slide, please. Make a good home run. Uh, there are risks involved in everyday business decision, including ensuring IP rights are protected and enforced. Uh, we are always at hand. There are a lot of information in this um, presentation, but we are here to help you on specific issues that you may share with us in confidence basis. We would like to hear from you after this session, and these are our contacts of the team in Singapore. We will also be very happy to share with you contacts of other IP attaches in other markets if you're considering the other regions. I'm only an email away. That's all from me. Thanks very much for your attention. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Christabel, uh, for that. Um, so you know, we were hearing uh, at the beginning about sort of many of the funds that are available and Christabel has certainly built upon that. I think one of the key sort of messages that is starting to come out here is very much to, to read that f fine print and perhaps we can talk a bit more about that in the, in the Q&A. So let's wrap uh, the, the presentations up um, and we'll hear from uh, Ronnie Wag now, um, and Ronnie is the managing partner at uh, Heron Advisory, and so in that role is a key contributor, sort of driving the transformation uh, across maritime and, and logistics. Uh, so he's an advisor to the startups, the corporates, and, and even governments, um, and really is about solving the the industry challenges. So so Ronnie's in a, a fantastic position to sort of talk to us about the maritime tech space here in Singapore. So over to you, Ronnie. Thank you, Justinian, um, for those kind words. And thank you to Maritime UK and the UK Department of International Trade uh, for inviting me to give this talk here this afternoon in Singapore or uh, somewhat early morning in London. Um, I am here to talk to you about the developments in the maritime technology space here in Singapore. Um, before can I have the next slide, please? Um, before we move on to that one back, thank you. Uh, before we move on to that to that part of it, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with with Heron Advisory, um, we are a Singapore headquartered consultancy. We have a strong international network in the maritime industry, 
um, and we work with startups and tech companies around the world. Um, as Justinian mentioned, we are advisors to corporates, governments, as well as accelerators. We have been involved with, with various programs, also including Pier 71 here in Singapore, and through our partnership with Betatron Venture Group in Hong Kong, uh, we are also early stage investors into uh, maritime and logistics technology companies uh, where we do investments worldwide. Um, and I'll reshare my contact information at the end of my presentation. If we could move to the next slide, please. Um, so briefly today, I want to run you through Singapore as a maritime tech hub, the role of the government, though that has been mentioned uh, in both the previous presentations, so we'll not focus very much on that. Talk about a few of the um, accelerator programs and uh, innovation challenges available out here for technology companies or innovators in the maritime space. Um, I will cover a few of the active investors, venture capital investors, corporate venture capital, et cetera, that are active in Singapore and the region, um, and then touch briefly upon uh, UK startup presence here in Singapore at the end of my presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So, Singapore as a maritime and logistics technology hub. Uh, Toby touched upon this and so did Christabel in her, in her presentation just now. Um, every year, DMEGL, the Classification Society, publishes a report uh, on the maritime cities of the world and Singapore has been number one in that report uh, ever since it came out the first time. Um, this has also been their goal. They have not yet made number one in maritime technology, but they are very determined to become number one also in technology and are working very hard towards that goal. Um, and if we look at what the key focus areas are uh, for Singapore as a maritime uh, technology hub, like what technologies sectors or what areas in the maritime industry do they focus on? Uh, when we talk about technology, the first one obviously is port and logistics, given that um, Singapore is one of the biggest transshipment hubs in the world. Um, bunkering is another segment under that because Singapore is, is, is the world's largest bunkering hub as well. And one thing is, is traditional fuels, but they are also looking very much into um, new and alternative fuels for the industry, uh, which, which Toby mentioned in his presentation with the most recent news being the, them jumping on the um, ammonia projects as well uh, as recently as, as, as yesterday. Um, another part is maritime operations. Singapore is a huge hub also for maritime operations, for ship management, uh, for crewing, for, um, for agency uh, business, for servicing of the vessels, etc. cetera. Um, Singapore is also very large in commodities and commodity trading, uh, also in trade in general, as well as trade finance. And um, most recently now, they also focused very much and will, will focus much, much more also on decarbonization in the years going forward. Um, next slide, please. So having touched upon the key factors, uh, the next part is the role of the government. Now, the Maritime Port Authority has been mentioned several times already. I will talk a bit more briefly about a few of the initiatives they have, which touch touch the maritime startup scene. Um, the first one is Pier 71, uh, also known as the Smart Port Challenge. It is an annual um, innovation challenge and accelerator program run uh, in a partnership between MPA and NUS Enterprise, which is the enterprise arm of the National University of Singapore, uh, NUS. NUS again is ranked as the number one university in Asia. Um, so they have Singapore is very strong in education. They're also very strong in supporting technology initiatives across a broad range of, of technologies. Uh, and NUS Enterprise plays a very, very important role there, um, having supported something like 25% of startups coming out of this uh, city. Um, another uh, thing that was launched a couple of years back is the MPA Living Lab or the MPA Innovation Lab. Um, this is the equivalent of a sandbox for the maritime industry, similar to what we find in fintech and financial technologies, where companies, be it startups or others, uh, can come in and test solutions in Singapore that are not yet regulated in current regulations. Um, and you can do so in, in a sort of a protected environment. Now, both Pier 71 and MPA Living Lab are not only ideas and concepts and programs, they are also physical spaces. Pier 71 is a co-working space in Singapore managed by the MPA 
um, and MPA Living Lab is also a physical space where if you need physical space as part of your trials, you can get that as well. Um, now, a lot of the some a few of the funding availabilities have been mentioned before. Um, the Mint Fund is one of those funds. It is managed by the MPA. I think Toby uh, gave us the exact number they handed out in the last 12 months or so. Uh, but they do support uh, a lot of joint initiatives or cross industry initiatives or initiatives uh, such as research or solution uh, development um, in collaboration between, say, a startup and a corporate uh, or the government and a technology company, et cetera. Uh, Enterprise Singapore has been mentioned. Uh, they are the enterprise arm of the Singapore government. They help and support startups and technology uh, companies across all sectors. Um, in the end of 2019, they launched a $50 million fund through their subsidiary Seeds Capital. Uh, and then they, on a tender, partnered with six uh, venture capital firms, corporate venture capital providers and others. I will get back to them in a later slide. Um, and in collaboration with these, they will invest that money as co-investments into, um, into maritime technology startups um, here in Singapore. Uh, I've also mentioned the Economic Development Board here. That is another arm of the government. Um, you're more likely to meet with them if you are a more established company looking to do something um, here in Singapore, or if you are based in Singapore looking to expand out of Singapore. Um, and one example of that is, for example, when, when DMEGL set up their R&D division in Singapore, that was done very much in collaboration with the Economic Development Board um, in Singapore, supporting that initiative and making Singapore the global hub for R&D uh, in that company. Um, we have seen similar initiatives also with what they have done in the last couple of years with 3D printing, uh, where they have been huge supporters and very, very active in supporting uh, all of the various initiatives across 3D printing uh, in maritime, uh, latest example being the collaboration between Wilhelmsen and Thyssenkrupp, uh, which makes Singapore sort of the de facto hub for uh, maritime uh, spare parts, 3D printed maritime spare parts. Um, so the role of the government here is very, very strong. They have a very active role uh, and they are a key driving force in, in, in ensuring Singapore remains a maritime hub and, and positions themselves as a maritime technology hub as well. Next slide, please. Now, uh, touching briefly also upon the accelerator programs and some of the startup challenges that you can find here in Singapore, Pier 71, Smart Port Challenge has been mentioned already. Uh, the, another one is EPS Techstars. They actually had their demo day just before our event, uh, which was their second cohort. Uh, it is a collaboration between Eastern Pacific Shipping, which is one of the biggest privately owned shipping companies based out of Singapore, and Techstars, the American investor, and Accelerator that have invested in, I think, more than 2,000 startups worldwide. Um, they also run an annual program. Uh, they scout globally for their startups, and they invest in the startups they take into their program. Uh, Rainmaking Transport uh, runs is a, is a Danish outfit, but they're part of it is based here in Singapore. Uh, they run the Trade Transport Impact Program, uh, which they ran a couple of rounds out of Hamburg, then transferred everything to Singapore, and then they've been running it out of Singapore for the past year and so. Um, when they moved it to Singapore, they changed their focus to, to, to purely being on decarbonization. They run two cohorts on decarbonization. And uh, as recent as this Tuesday, when they had their um, portfolio day, uh, they also launched their uh, supply chain initiative. So they will also run a program on supply chain technology. Um, Entrepreneur First is another one that are not specifically focused on maritime in any way or form, but they have, uh, but several maritime and logistics related startups have grown out of Entrepreneur First. And of course, Entrepreneur First is a UK, um, has their origin in the UK. Port XL is another one. Um, they had a physical presence here in the past. They're headquartered in Rotterdam, um, but they have a collaboration with a Singapore-based venture capital firm called August One, uh, through which they um, run uh, a at least virtual program for the first time in, 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 in 2020. And I'm not certain what they plan to do for the future with that. Um, the last one here in Singapore is the Ocean of Opportunities Challenge. It's an annual uh, innovation challenge run by Ocean Network Express and Symphony Solutions. ONE is the 
operating arm uh, of the three major Japanese container lines, and ONE is headquartered here in Singapore. Um, well, another one worth mentioning is Captain Stable Innovation Challenge, though not based here in Singapore. It's based out of Hong Kong, um, but it has a global, it scouts globally. It has had UK startups on the program, as has, I think, all of the programs above as well have had UK technology companies, UK startups uh, involved as participants. It's also worth mentioning that the winner of Captain Stable Innovation Challenge, both the two past winners have been Singapore-based technology companies. Um, Next slide, please. Um, now, having talked about the programs, we get on to the investors. Uh, investors in this space include, uh, as mentioned already, EPS Techstars. Uh, and most recently, Eastern Pacific Shipping actually made a direct investment into a technology company called F Drones, which are doing deliveries uh, to vessels here in Singapore and running trials under the MPA Living Lab concept where they're able to do so. And they do that in collaboration with several of the shipping companies, including Berger Bollock. They do it together with Wilhelmsen, uh, the Bernard Schulte Group, which we also mentioned here. Um, the second one on the list is Rainmaking Transport. Uh, it should say Motion Ventures because they actually launched their fund just this afternoon, just before uh, we went live um, and Ocean Ventures was their working name for the fund, but Motion Ventures is the official name. They did first close uh, on that fund and they will start investing uh, very soon, uh, primarily, at, le at least initially from what I understand, into companies that are part of their program and cohorts in decarbonization and supply chain. Innoport is the venture capital arm, uh, corporate venture capital arm of the Bernhard Schulte Group, uh, biggest ship owner in Germany, one of the biggest in the world. They have a presence here in Singapore, even though they're headquartered in Hamburg. Uh, PSA Unboxed was mentioned before. It is the corporate venture capital arm of PSA. PSA is the port operator um, of the uh, Singapore port, as well as another 39 ports in 15 countries around the world. Another one is Quest Ventures, who collaborate with Ships Focus. We also have KSL Maritime Ventures, which is the venture arm of the Quok Group, which again owns Pacific Carriers, um, another family owned business. And Rainmaking, Innoport, PSA, Quest, and KSL are five of the six companies that are backed by the Seeds Capital $50 million fund for their investments. Um, Seeds has also backed the Motion Ventures initiative that Rainmaking launched. Uh, the last one I mentioned here on the list is Singapore's Reef Not Ventures. They are a collaboration between, uh, between uh, Kuna Nagel, the world's largest freight forwarding company, and Temasek Holding, the Singapore, um, the Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund. They have $50 million fund and they invest $5 million per investment, so they make only a couple of investments a year. Um, the last one here is Betatron Venture Group, uh, of which I am a venture partner, though we are headquartered in Hong Kong. Uh, three of us as venture partners are based here in Singapore, and we've made several investments in technology companies in Singapore and maritime logistics is one of our core verticals. Um, next slide, please. Now, having touched upon uh, a broad range of, of the maritime technology space here in Singapore, uh, I wanted to bring this um, a little bit more back to, back to the UK, so to speak. Um, mentioning three uh, companies uh, from three startups, technology companies that have a link to the UK. The first one's Bunker X. They're headquartered in London. They took part in the inaugural Pier 71 program uh, that I was part of running back in 2018. And so they, uh, the, founder, the founder of the company was here physically in Singapore for three months taking part in that program, uh, which I know that they benefited from the time that they spent in this part of the world. Uh, the second one is Cyber Owl. Cyber Owl is also London headquartered. They set up their Singapore subsidiary office last year in the midst of the pandemic. Um, they also took part in EPS Techstars in the previous round, and they took part in the Captain's Table Innovation Challenge 2020. Uh, and then uh, Greywing, which is a Singapore uh, company, but the founder of uh, which came out of Entrepreneur First. However, the founder of Grey Wing is a, formal, uh, is a former uh, Royal Marine uh, of the uh, British military, um, though he uh, relocated here to Singapore uh, to, to set up his, uh, his startup uh, company here from Singapore. 
uh, in the maritime space. Um, it's a very interesting company. They're growing very fast and they were now taken into the Y Combinator in the United States as the only maritime company or only maritime startup um, in this uh, winter cohort with Y Combinator. Um, so those are three examples. And so of course, my next question then is, will you, uh, one of our viewers be uh, the next company uh, or next startup that uh, comes out here to Singapore or uh, collaborates with any of us that are based out here in this part of the world. Um, next slide, please. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much again to uh, Justinian and to Maritime UK and to the Department for International Trade for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today, uh, to share a little bit about what's happening in the maritime technology startup scene in Singapore, as well as a little bit of the region touching upon Hong Kong as well. Uh, and with that, we are at the end of, of my presentation, I think all three presentations. So with that, I hand the word back to, uh, back to you, Justinian. Of course, if anyone has any questions, my contact details are on the screen. Feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks, Ronnie, for that. Um, uh, really insightful. I mean, I, we've got a real sense from you there of what the opportunities are and just the um, sheer amount of funding available um, uh, uh, here in here in Singapore. Um, there's, a, there's a question already in, in the inbox, which I'll come to in just a moment, but if anyone else has a question, do put it in there. Uh, before I come to the one in the inbox, I'd just like to go back to a point uh, that Toby sort of made to begin with and put this question first to Toby and then to you, Ronnie. But yeah, we were talking about here in Singapore, all of the R&D investment and what's, what's happening in terms of some of these tech investments. Um, at the end of the day, shipping maritime still remains a, uh, an industry dominated by people. And so I'm wondering what the sort of workforce of the future could look like, given the investments in the R&D and in tech, um, what do we think the, the maritime um, workforce would look like? So first to, to Toby and then to, to Ronnie. Well, um, Justin, thank you very much. I think uh, the, the whole purpose of um, the various funds available, um, uh, in, in particular the cluster fund, is to, um, is to try and develop the, uh, the workforce into a skilled, uh, technologically uh, savvy um, workforce that will be able to support and grow the uh, the economy. Now, I mean, what does that mean? Uh, I, uh, they're not looking at, at um, uh, specific subsectors. Um, my understanding is that they want to be able to take um, uh, the, uh, um, the the population, the workforce here in in Singapore, and upskill them, um, focusing them into the uh, the key uh, areas of which maritime is one, right the way across. So from engineering and technology, uh, computers, uh, tech, uh, digitization, um, right the way through to um, uh, the, uh, the you know, finance, tertiary services, um, professional sectors. So um, it, when, we, when we look at that, they are very keen to encourage um, businesses to, to come here, bring the, um, uh, the, the skill, um, bring uh, that understanding and uh, for, uh, for the workforce here to be able to, to learn from, um, from those of us that have been in the, the industry a bit longer um, and um, you know, turn them into um, uh, not just reliable employees, but um, uh, in, internationally focused, you know, global leaders um, of the future, and that's what they're keen to do. Thanks, Toby. Uh, Ronnie, a, a view from you. I think uh, Toby touches upon the the sort of government take on this for the workforce as a whole, and and where we are uh, moving in 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 terms of upskilling um, the local workforce and and what kind of talent they're looking to to attract. Singapore has always been very much a hub. Um, for, for talents as well as, as well as many other things, trade, of course, being another one. Um, I think if you look at it from um, the point of, of view of maritime technology, uh, Singapore has, as they do with, with many other things, they've, they've had a very, very strong focus on making themselves a hub for technology in general. Uh, I think if we look at venture capital as an example, Singapore went from having zero venture capital firms to something like 150 venture capital 
uh, firms and the presence of a, a number of the major American ones uh, that you might have heard of as well, just over the course of, of something like 10 years. Um, of course, the fact that Singapore is a zero tax environment for venture capital uh, helps in that situation. But another one is, of course, you have a trusted legal system, a trusted IP system, uh, and a number of other factors that attract things to Singapore. They do the same thing when it comes to technology. They want to attract bright minds to come here and start businesses here. Um, they want to attract uh, existing technology companies to, to relocate their headquarter from wherever they are to Singapore. Um, they might not relocate their entire physical uh, setup, but, uh, but Singapore very often becomes the de facto sort of legal entity hub um, IP hub, et cetera, for those companies. So they really, they really focus their efforts on, on bringing talent uh, as well as technologies and, and, and IP and all these elements into Singapore, strengthening Singapore as a whole uh, with a lot of government support around it. Um, and, and in terms of, of uh, if your question leads in the direction of, of uh, what happens to the people when the technology takes over, um, I, I don't think we'll be creating companies and, and building startups and developing technologies without people in any, in any, any time soon. So it still requires a lot of talent and Singapore is very focused on that. Um, my personal take on some of these developments as well is equivalent to what we've seen a lot over the last years is uh, no matter how much more advanced our technologies become, they tend to create new jobs and different jobs and, and, and new opportunities for people as much as removing old jobs um in the process uh we will probably need to upscale and upskill a lot of pe people uh to, to move in that direction but uh i think they're taking at least a lot of the steps to get there um as a as a nation um i i see them strengthen their position their position as well as as an attractive uh, hub for both talent and technologies yeah Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, absolutely. And I think you've both really touched on the importance of uh, that Singapore is placing in, in people and, and, and upskilling. Um, we've got one question. We've got five minutes to go. So one question that has come in, um, and this is uh, to, to you, Christabel, um, and it is, um, you, know, you, you touched on the fact that in the UK, um, often um, if, you're, if you're receiving investment um, into your, your R&D, that you retain that IP um, through, uh, through that fund. But that doesn't always sound like it's the case um, for some of the funds out here in Singapore. So what advice is there um, for companies to reserve their rights in the event that they do benefit from Singaporean co-investment? Right. So... I can't be 100% sure that every UK invested uh, or interest fund is, is in the likes as uh, what mentioned by Nick. But I would say when we look at Singapore, the, fund, the funds that are available and its fine prints varies across um, between sectors and even within the maritime, each funding have its own fine prints and they, 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 they differ uh, fund, funding and incentives and grants. And these fine prints are reviewed Periodically, they are updated and they change. So three years ago's funding may be slightly different in terms of funding, uh, the fine prints, say this year or next year. So the key advice here is really to scrutinize the fine prints. I think Toby will love that because that's, you have to read because if you just sign off, you are in it. When you're unclear, even with one or two lines and you sign off, that could come back and hit you. And, and that we wouldn't want that to happen because that's where it's already a binding agreement, a binding contract. So there could indeed be free lunch, I would say, but we must be very sure what are the strings attached. Um, it, it's not going to, I think the whole intention of this question and this session is not to scare you or let you know that the outside, the, the sort of uncharted waters are scary, but it's to make you very cautious uh, what are the minefields, what are the landmines, where are the potholes, so that you are prepared when situation happens. And, and that's where you have to do your part in terms of due diligence, read the fine prints, find out exactly, know enough about the fundings. If you're unsure, find out from DIT, find out from, from Ronnie, from Toby, find out from the networks that you have to make it clear before you sign. And depending on your company strategy, sometimes you will see that the terms and con condition could work for you. And it's in, in favor uh, where you are in terms of your expansion, you are happy to be collaborative. Now, looking at um, the last 
year or so when we look at some of the texts to inquiries from companies coming to us and say, what do you think of this particular fund agreement? We can't give legal advice, but when we look at the particular IP clause in it, majority of the time is very similar to the UK, but we do not want to take advantage of that the understanding that all rights will be retained by the innovator, by the funder, by the company. Um, reason, as I've mentioned in my earlier sharing is there is a lot for the funder if they want to co-own because there is a lot of situation where you have to maintain the cost and if the patent goes into a uh, patent dispute, what's the role of the funder and the creator? So there's a lot um, of implications for funders and organizers if they want to share of the right. Most of the time, the terms of condition would state, you are the one who created the innovation, the invention, you are the patent owner, you are the right owner, you take care of it. We as the organizer will, be, will not be implicated by any infringements or any cases arising out of it. So those are what we have seen in the last one year. It should still be valid, but check the fine prints. Great, thanks, thanks for that, Christabel. Um, We've got one minute to go, basically, uh, and uh, an interesting question has come in, uh, which I will uh, ask Ronnie to see if he can answer in a sentence. Um, uh, but this is probably justifying an entire webinar itself. Uh, but the question is, is you, know, you provided some great insights into all the funding that's happening here in Singapore in Maritime. So what do you see is the next game-changing innovation that might be coming out from here? So if you can try and give me one. It's a, <laughs> it's a tough, uh, tough question to answer because you kind of have to predict the future uh, to, to, to some degree because it would be something that isn't visibly uh, already on its way out of the market as, as we see it right now. Um, there is a lot of innovation taking place uh, in the university sector and, and in parallels to it. Uh, and there is a lot of funding coming in to, to back the commercialization of some of these solutions. I, I would uh, expect us to see um, a few developments in or towards decarbonization coming out of Singapore with the amount of capital that is being put into that and with the amount of initiatives that the government are also involving themselves in um, with regards to decarbonization. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if we would see something coming out of that. Uh, I think if you look at Motion Ventures, which Rainmaking Transport launched today, um, which, which with the plan of making that a 30 million Singapore dollar fund, um, they will be investing into decarbonization as one of their key uh, elements uh, or one of their key focus areas as well. Um, so something in that space, but one specific technology is, is, is or a specific solution is, is, is very difficult to, to predict uh, sitting here right now. Great, thanks for that. Well, we've come to the very end. Um, thank you so much to um, all of our speakers today for their, for their time and their insights. Thanks to Maritime UK for helping to uh, put this, this on. Uh, there's a lot of information that's been provided today. Um, so do reach out to any of us um, for any follow-ups. Uh, we're all on LinkedIn, um, so you can easily find us. Uh, I think the slides will be made available um, from DIT London. Um, and I think probably for me, some of the key takeaways from today is, you know, there's a lot that's happening out here in Singapore. Um, you know, as Ronnie said at the very end there, we'd like to see hopefully you out here if you're not already here, but plan, plan very carefully um, and think about, you know, what, go to Christabel's point, what are you going to give away and what are you getting? Um, and always remember that IP is a private right. So with that, um, I'll end the session and thank you very much.